just upload. Um, ja, ja. Ja. So, uh, Elsie, uh, perhaps you can uh, start with um, uh, introducing yourself. Okay. Good morning, everyone. It's uh, just after nine o'clock in the UK on a very grey morning from where I'm sitting. Um, I am a clinical midwife. I'm also very active in the voluntary sector, mainly around mental health for women, uh, young black men, and I'm also involved in working with our regulatory body on their patient forum. This presentation that I'm doing today is just sharing the work that we're doing within a small team of midwives called Mimosa Midwives. We've come together to work as midwives because we are passionate about um, our profession and we want to make sure that we make a contribution, however small, to helping women to birth well. So the title of my presentation today is The Power of Cultural Safety When Different Worlds Meet. And it's all about our work that we've been doing over the past few years within our team. As midwives, we are privileged to work with women at a momentous and mostly beautiful time of their lives. It is also a time of high expectation, of having to trust strangers, and of the fear of the unknown. As midwives, we are autonomous practitioners of midwifery. We hold the responsibility of caring for each individual through a normal life process, most of the time. As maternity services and technology have advanced, the normal process of birth has moved progressively into the medicalized hierarchical structure of the hospital, graded according to the degree of risk they are able to handle. Midwives have therefore to not only recognize the abnormal and refer women appropriately, but now, now we are more and more involved with treating the abnormal. Midwifery training and ed education, therefore, has needed to extend to highly advanced technical and theoretical knowledge and skills. And our statutory requirement for the maintenance of professional competence has also included utilizing the requisite knowledge and skills that we need for our work. Within the time constraints for the education and regular professional updating of the midwife, we find that there is a real threat of the knowledge and skills within the art and craft of midwifery to be left behind. And the hospital system and the set NHS target in the UK require that managers must find the most cost effective way to deliver the most efficient service. So what we've noticed in the UK is that slowly over time, what was once by and large a growing profession has begun to show signs of slowing down in, in, in many different ways. So recently, um, th this presentation is actually coming out of uh, a request to share um, some work that we were doing within the local migration partnership working. And they, 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 um, they were looking at a more detailed focus on the area of migration in health um, within the area. Because the birth rates in England have risen over the last 10 years. And we found that migration is one factor in the, for the increase. In England, they, they noted that over one in four births was being um, to a woman who was not born in the UK. So as providers and commissioners of maternity services, we needed to respond to the changes in the, in the local population. We also had to take into account the different factors that impacted and, uh, on, the, on the maternity and the different language and cultural needs in the UK health system and the, the, you know, how people actually understood that. 
Within the area in which we work, in the West Midlands, we also saw a significant change in the profile of women who make up the maternity services. So the level of birth to non-UK born women is, is high in some places in, in the West Midlands. They were also looking in this forum at the different challenges that are faced by women in the area. And they were looking to see what the challenges were to consider the evidence on the outcomes for women and look at examples that help to improve the, um, the, the maternity care for women of these different communities. So to go to my second slide, um, our work is actually based on the international um, consideration of midwives, definition of the midwife, really, and her role and scope. And it's there on the screen, and I'm sure we all have a, 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 an understanding of it in terms of um, what midwives do and how she works and where she may work. But in our work as um, our practice, we actually try very hard to work to that as much as we can. We are freer as, in as much as we are a, a group of private midwives, we are freer to work to our code of practice because we are not employed by any NHS trust. We, we, we're not employed by um, an NHS trust. So our benchmark to our practice is the rules and the code of the Nursing and Medicine Council who regulate us as midwives. Can we have a second slide, please? So, the first consideration we, we had was um, who is a migrant woman? And actually, um, defining this woman was uh, a, a little bit um, contentious in as much as they're different, the, the definition is not conclusive. There are many classifications of a migrant, a migrant and a migrant woman depending on which angle you're looking at it. So for example, the legal, the, the legal status for migrant women. So for example, the, in the UK, we have undocumented migrants. But basically, from our perspective as midwives, we take it to mean a person who moves from one place to another, whether it's for work, for better living conditions, and quite cert certainly in, in the area in which we work, a lot of women come for um, education, you know, to, to better their education, or they come with their husbands or partners to, uh, for working, for their working. We also have quite a high population of women who are refugees and asylum seeking women who are not actually entitled to have um, public funds, they're not entitled to public funds. So we have quite a wide uh, a, a number of women. In, in Birmingham itself, which is the main city uh, to our work in, we have what is, has been termed super diversity. So we have people from all over the world actually living in Birmingham for one thing or another. We have certainly more than 108 different languages spoken, uh, cultures to match, and in fact, we have a, quite a bit of mixed heritage women. Um, and families. We also notice that there is um, a change, a constant change actually in, in the profile of the population who live and work in Birmingham. The issues for maternity care is one of the issues that we, you know, the things that we, we were focused on certainly in our work. Um, and what we found is the, the usual things like language, um, and that would actually impact on informed consent. We are required to give information to women in order that they can actually make a decision. So it, 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 unless we speak the language of the woman, we would have to use an interpreter. And interpretation is one of the benchmarks of the services that are delivered. We also encountered different cultural practices which would impact on 
the care given and the care received by the woman and how she actually managed her pregnancy, her childbirth and, and her postnatal period as well. So in terms of, uh, for example, one of the big issues are around uh, diet. Um, there were many issues in terms of women, depending on their status in, in society, being able to afford um, nutritious food. Uh, there were also issues about types of foods to be eaten within pregnancy, depending on which culture you came from. How you managed um, sleeping with baby, you know, from, from many cultures closely, which in this culture, uh, in terms of guidance, NHS guidance, um, co-sleeping isn't something that is encouraged. In fact, it is actively discouraged. Um, one of the issues that we came across as well was um, how systems work together or don't work together. And working across systems we found um, to be quite difficult in terms of how the NHS systems are work, work, how they work or don't work together. So um, an example of that would be Trying to, for example, um, work as private midwives, getting women into NHS systems so that they could actually access care. So, one example would be something like a woman who is whose immigration status is not secured, who is pregnant, who needs to be booked by 12 weeks so that she can actually have her regular scans and she, she may want to ha access all the things that are, uh, have been laid down as good practice within English NHS. So for a dating scan, she would need to book early so that she could actually access. So whether she was able to pay for this or not, there is still a difficulty actually getting her registered with a general practitioner to get her into the, the NHS system. That is really quite difficult to achieve at times because the rules will change as to whether she has to pay, not pay, whether she has to prove her status or not prove her status. So these are the sorts of system, um, difficulties we meet within systems when we're trying to work with women across sectors and actually break down some of the barriers that are there. And some of them are actually not intentional barriers, but they happen because systems develop separately. So we actually see some inequalities in access. We see inequalities in terms of treatment, and we also see inequalities in terms of outcomes. So um, this is well known across um, the, 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 the sectors that there are certain categories of women, depending on where their, their racial um, origin, that their outcomes will not be as good as the indigenous population. So for example, the um, triennial review of maternity services, which happens in the UK, shows that there are women of African heritage and Pakistani heritage. Those women are more, more likely to suffer poorer outcomes than women of indigenous population. So, how do we overcome these? What we try to do is work to best practice um, as mimosa midwives. And the women we look after, um, we are contracted to look after, we deliver a one-to-one -one continuity of care, simply because that is shown to be giving the best outcome for women, women per se, but in particular, the more vulnerable women. Uh, the women that we are not contracted to look after, who we actually support. So, for example, women who with no recourse to public funds, who do not actually, they're not able to pay for their care, and who have a very minimum style of care within the NHS. We actually support them in terms of the other work that we do on, in, in the voluntary sector. So, they will come and attend our aquanatal classes. And those classes actually help to empower women to feel good about themselves, 
to take some exercise, we support them in terms of advice given, you know, around diet, uh, postnatal exercises. We talk to them about things like um, Kegel exercises and, and just generally support the mental and physical well-being as best we can within what we're doing in, 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 for the project that we're leading. In terms of the evidence base that we use, um, we try to stick to best evidence. And in the, the, the work that we use is based on um, David Sackett, but also some of the other work that we've done with the independent midwives in the United Kingdom when we were looking at best ways of working. So, Primarily, evidence-based to us, uh, to quote, is a conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. And we can actually do that because we are working one-to-one -one with small caseloads of women. So to go on to quote, the practice of evidence-based medicine means integrating individual clinical expertise with the best available external clinical evidence from systemic, systematic research. By individual clinical expertise, we mean the proficiency and judgment that clin individual clinicians acquire through clinical experience and clinical practice. It is reflected in many ways, but especially in more effective and efficient diagnosis and in the more thoughtful identification and compassionate use of individual patients' predicaments, rights and preferences in making clinical decisions about their care. We try to integrate individual expertise, therefore, with the best external evidence. We use a bottom-up approach, primarily because that actually puts the woman at the centre of her care. And we use the external evidence to inform how we work, but it doesn't in, uh, replace our individual expertise as clinicians. And we also bring our life experience to our work so that we integrate all of these things to help, um, to help inform decision making for the woman. So things in the UK that help us also, uh, we use what the NHS will use as guidance. So the, we just use it as guidance, um, the, the Cochrane Reviews and the NICE guidance, which actually helps to bring breadth to how we, we work with the women. But most importantly, we use the values of the patient to help, um, to, to, to help our approach and, and improve the care that we give. To the women. So our team, Mimosa Midwives, who are we? We're a small team. Uh, as I said before, we use one-to-one -one, um, methods of working because that actually helps to produce continuity of care and developing relationships of trust and confidence which is really so important to, to, to the outcomes for women. It helps them to make the decisions for themselves. Um, and as I said, you know, we use um, best evidence to actually inform our work. Our midwives are, um, there are five of us in our team who work actively together to, to um, deliver care to women on, on the many different fronts that we work. Um, we have within the team um, a lactation consultant who is also an aromatherapist, an aquanatal instructor. She's also had quite a significant number of NHS um, years of experience and latterly commissioning um, experience as well. So she's able to, she was a city lead for the breastfeeding um, in, the, in the commissioning sector and she's able to spend quite a bit of time supporting us and the mothers in terms of breastfeeding to improve outcomes for, for the moms themselves and also for the future generations. 
we also have within the team um, two people who are qualified to, to teach and one who is actually completing her teaching. So we have quite a significant um, expertise around education, education of students, but also our own education. So we spend a fair chunk of time sharing our updates and making sure that we are fit to practice in that way. We're supported by a very senior, well, she was a very senior midwife within the NHS. And she's out, you know, on retirement. Instead of going back into the NHS to do um, bank work, temporary work, she's chosen to join us. And she was a very senior person in terms of her leading. She led a team of midwives when continuity of care was being piloted in the NHS. She's now working with us and she coordinates quite a bit of our practice within her level of seniority. Within the team also, we have a considerable amount of expertise of working in the voluntary sector. So one of our midwives who is now working in education had worked with a short start um, within the community doing developing groups around postnatal depression. Um, she worked with young mothers, fathers, doing things like baby massage to um, help them to connect um, with, with, with their babies. A significant number of our midwives also indulge in alternative therapy and we all use all our skills to actually work with women not only in a medical fashion or midwifery fashion, but also we bring our social skills to, to our work to support women to prepare to birth well and to move on with their lives in terms of looking after their children. We teach aquanatal classes. We also deliver parent craft classes on a one-to-one -one or indeed um, on, a, on a group basis as well. We're very fortunate um, in as much as our supervisor of midwives is very woman-centered and midwifery orientated. She works within an NHS trust as a senior manager and has been a mid midwifery supervisor for quite some time now. She supports our practice, making sure that certainly we meet at least once a year, but quite often we meet more than that. And she supports our practice to make sure that our equipment is up to date. Um, and that we are continuing our learning professionally and personally so that we are able to function or as autonomous midwives that we want to be. So, how do how did we gather our evidence base? Our evidence base actually came from a variety of different sources. Um, and all of the members of the team. So, for example, um, I had a, um, an experience of looking very closely at what was happening in New Zealand to improve maternity care. And out of that experience, we have chosen to embed the concept of cultural safety within our practice because we found it to be the simpler and most effective way of working as a one-to-one -one, but also as a team and just to um, share with you some of the concepts around cultural safety for those who have never heard of it it's about an environment which is safe for people where there is no assault challenge or denial of their identity of who they are and what they need it's about shared respect shared meaning shared knowledge and experience of learning together with dignity and truly listening. It requires a consideration of issues of power and not just the imbalance of power between a patient and a medical professional, but the wider origins of that power beyond the hospital. Consciously or unconsciously, such power reinforced by unsafe, prejudicial or demeaning attitudes and wielded inappropriately by health workers could cause people to distrust and avoid the health service. It also develops the idea 
that to provide quality care for people from different ethnicities than the mainstream, healthcare providers must embrace the skill of self-reflection as a means to advancing a therapeutic encounter and provide care congruent with the knowledge that the cultural values and norms of the patient are different from his or her own. And for us, that, that just encompass all the things that we want to deliver as midwives working on our own outside of a system. In fact, what we're doing is develop a system of our own. Um, the other um, evidence base that came to us was um, one of the midwives who was working within a trust was actually asked to look at the journey. She was asked to map the journey of the patient through the system that the trust was using. And what she found basically was that the women who were um, vulnerable, termed vulnerable migrants in terms of high social risk or high medical risk, were the ones who had the most fragmented care and the ones that midwives found very difficult to look after. Subsequently, within the um, pressurized environment that they were being cared for and the fragmentation meant that their outcomes were poorer. That piece of research was actually mainstream within a trust to improve the, the, the care that was being offered to women, vulnerable women. And the outcome was that they had employed and supported one midwife to actually lead on that. The third piece of evidence that we used within our team was a piece of research done in a particular area of Birmingham, where a midwife who, a community midwife who was trying very hard to get a one-to-one -one scheme up and running, she decided to look at the areas of continuity and discontinuity of maternity care for the women in the area. And her revelations, you know, showed basically the saying that the discontinuity actually didn't help the women, either physically, mentally, and they, they felt very disadvantaged by the care that they were offered and that they received. Happily, I have to say that um, within that area, now there is a home birth team that's been set up and is being evaluated and so far it's running really well. In about 2006, the commissioners, the local commissioners did a set of um, reviews of maternity services to look to see how it was that they could actually improve the perinatal mortality rate um, for, for the area because they actually acknowledged that you know, there, there were significant problems for the locality. And again, based on that, they made certain improvements in um, how the maternity care pathway should run. But having said that, they didn't make any changes in terms of how midwives were working with women at the cold phase. So it was more of a sort of strategic change rather than a front line, um, you know, rather than it going down to the front line. So there was no bottom-up approach to that. Myself, I, as part of my update, I attended a Red Cross meeting um, for the first time ever, you know, really looking carefully at what was happening. I was astonished to find the experience of women who were refugees and asylum-seeking women within the city, what was happening to them. Um, that their care was less than everybody else was having. There were, and, and this was the impact of the, the immigration system. Um, for example, they would be not seen, they would be coming from another area, and then they would not be seeing a midwife straight away. There was no um, smooth pathway transferring them from one area to the next. Consequently, they would fall through the gaps in the system and perhaps woman at 36 weeks pregnant would turn up in a hospital and then go into labor and just land on the doorstep of the nearest hospital um, with very few maternity notes. And of course, the, the outcomes for such women are not as good as women who've had 
continuity of care or indeed of carer um, within a system that knew who she was, what her issues were, and so on. Subsequently to that, um, within the area in which we work, the Maternity Alliance, which is an organization set up in the United Kingdom to support maternity care, and in particular focused on um, undocumented migrants, refugees and asylum seeking women, and so on. Um, they decided to have some practical training around the policies, um, the immigration policies, and what people were entitled to have, etc. So our team was actually invited and did take part in the training. So we, we, we gained some knowledge about what the policy is saying that um, pregnant women need to have and should have um, and the laws. But in fact, what happens is that as a result of legislation, there is quite a bit of changes and sometimes it's very difficult to discern what people are entitled to. So for example, um, just to clarify that, it used to be that um, women are entitled to be registered with a general practitioner in order to access maternity services. Um, and at this moment in time, as a result of recent legislative change, there is no such um, requirement to accept women onto general practitioner lists. So the implication for women, such women who have um, whose immigration status is not clear means that she may or may not get onto a GP list and she may not be um, booked for quite some considerable or in, indeed booked at all and just end up turning up at the local hospital when she's in labor or if there is a problem just turning up at accident and emergency. So these are the sorts of things that impact um, in the UK, there are um, patient committees known as the Maternity Services Liaison Committees. These were set up in statute some years ago, and each NHS trust was required to have a, a, such a committee set up in order that the voices of patients and service users informed how the service was run and the service that they received. This is no longer the case, but most hospitals, in fact, have kept their committees now. So quite a lot of the information that's fed back to uh, hospitals uh, that are creating pathways for all their patients, um, quite a few of the hospitals have kept their committees. And they're quite useful because, they, you know, we, we glean quite a bit of information and we're able to input Certainly, um, sometimes it's very difficult for women who do not have English as their first language to input. So our team, there are two people, certainly two people on our team who regularly attend the local MSLC committee to input on behalf and to advocate for better services for women uh, who, who are not able to, to, to speak for themselves clearly or who might be, even be afraid to, to speak for themselves. And then we have national reviews which are ongoing from time to time. Um, the confidential inquiries into maternity services has been very, very useful um, in, to tease out the, the problem. So for example, um, there were years when hemorrhage was uh, the, the main the main cause of death, and we were able to actually um, do something about remedying that. At this moment in time, the things on the agenda are perinatal mental health, and there is an ongoing um, maternal review, or review of maternity services, a major review of maternity services, which has just started now to look at how it is that we can improve maternity services for all women. So in terms of how we work as Mimosa Midwives, we want to continue working with this model 
Um, so the continuity of care, carer is a holistic model. We work in partnership. Um, we've actually achieved a good way of team working. We're learning quite a bit about maternity funding and we're certainly delivering a lot in terms of the satisfaction for mothers and for midwives. We have seen that the women are more satisfied all round, particularly in terms of their support for breastfeeding. Um, and because we have a social focus, we're actually able to help women to birth, well, to prepare themselves for birth. We support them to birth well. Sometimes we do that in the home, sometimes we do that in hospital, but whatever it is, we are there for them at all times, as professional midwives, but certainly being a very more sort of social, uh, midwifery social approach to our work. And we will stick to our principles in terms of cultural safety. So, just to take a uh, phrase from the Welsh Assembly in 2002, and I think, to, to, to be quite honest, the UK does try to work very hard towards supporting good midwifery practice. But for us, you know, it, it, like the Welsh, Welsh Assembly um, has said, birth is not a patient episode, but an event of great social and emotional significance. And that is the way we will actually go forward for women, as again, using the benchmark of the cultural safety. So looking to the future then, there's still clearly quite a lot to be done. We are a small team, we are looking to grow, we have quite a few people who are actually um, working, who are looking to work with us, and we are looking to actually develop into a larger team and to work nationally to help others to set up in this way. We're using national policy, policy uh, because the, the, the policy in the main, or the policies in the main, are fantastic policies. But there is something that actually prevents them to come down to the working level. We seek to work in partnership, and we do that ourselves with the gender, local general practitioners, the health visitors, the social workers, general, yeah, and the GPs, um, other midwives. So working with a woman, say for example, who we work in hospital, so we she might want her antenatal and postnatal care out of hospital, but we also work with the NHS to help her and support her within the NHS um, for her birth. Um, and then franchising is one of the things we're looking at to see how it is that we can spread our model because we think actually it is a very good model and it is the midwives way of working. Um, in terms of the mothers, um, they certainly have better physical outcomes. And we've certainly impacted on them in terms of their mental outcomes and their emotional outcomes because whether she has a vaginal birth, uh, an emergency cesarean section, or whatever sort of experience she's had through her birth continuum, we always go back at some point to debrief and to share. And many of the women actually keep in touch with us over lengthy periods of time. So that's us. Um, any questions that you might want to ask? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Elsie. We have one question. Uh, Nada asked, um, do you use interpreters uh, in your services or any other tools to overcome, overcome language barriers? Well, we use the inter... Well, we, we don't actually employ interpreters or we have we do have access to interpreters via the NHS um, if we're working within the NHS if we're working with women who are say for example somebody comes to our aquanatal class who doesn't speak English then we utilize the forum that they've come from so they may come from a, uh, an organization that supports migrant women they will have interpreters, so we use their interpreters. So we don't actually employ interpreters at the moment, but we use what there is in, in the systems that they're coming from to, to support them. Mm -hmm. And any other tools to overcome language barriers? 
Well, we use a lot of smiling, um, you know, positive, positive um, gestures. So if we're teaching an aquanator class, for example, to a woman, I, I use that because we have that on a regular basis, to a woman who, um, who doesn't speak English, then we will use, certainly in the aquanator class, we are, um, we're using gestures, we're demonstrating the movement, but we would also combine that with explanation before the class. So um, say we have to do an assessment of the, the, the woman's status before she joins the class. And we would do that in conjunction with the worker who brings her, because generally the workers will bring the women to the class. So we'll do that assessment whilst the worker is present. And then we will talk through, um, we do, um, pelvic floor exercises in the pool when we're in the pool so we'll make sure to do the pelvic floor exercises when the worker is present um, so that when we get to that point in the pool the woman knows exactly what it is she's supposed to be doing um, yeah and we you know we just do the best we can with what we've got really so uh Sarah is also putting in that lab. laughter is helping much and um, uh, Julia uh, says uh, also touch and patient is uh, very helpful. Um, yes, uh, do we have any other questions? Uh, so put in oh yeah, there's one about the challenge of the midwife franchise. Ah yeah, thank, thank you very much. Yes. Yes, I've seen that. So, Franchising is the method that we have aspired to. There is a movement in the United Kingdom and to, to improve maternity services by using small groups of midwives. Now, that has been accepted by the new lead of NHS England, who is leading on service. And within the document, it's called the five-year forward plan, if you want to look it up. Within that document, for the first time, we've seen this official support for small groups of midwives to develop ways of working that improve the maternity outcome. And what we would like to do is to work with, and in fact, we started working with a national team of midwives who are developing franchise because we believe that that is the way to go. So if, for example, we have small groups who are working to the same principles, who are being supported, and it's quite expensive to, to fund the maternity service the way things are now, it's quite an expensive business. But if we have a central body that develops a franchise, and is then able to give it out to little groups of midwives across the country. So we're all working to the same standards, to the same um, uh, principles, then we have a better chance of succeeding as far as the giving of and the receiving of care is concerned, rather than it being this huge organization that can't actually, you know, it's working at the top level, but somewhere down the bottom it doesn't meet the needs of women. So the barriers to franchising, I think, at this moment in time, are helping groups of midwives to realize that they actually have the power to work in this way. It is challenging, yes, but they can be overcome. Um, it can be hard work. We have to be prepared to build small, work, good working teams. Um, so, and then we need some money, <laughs> which is always the biggest challenge. We need huge amounts of funding to actually develop the structures that will help midwives to work in this way. Mm -hmm. And then you have the men in grey suits who largely dictate policy and we have to convince them that, you know, this is the way. But that, that in itself is, is, is not so bad. It's about helping women to understand that we have to come together in order to, to, to improve the service, and this is one way that we can actually achieve it. Okay. Um, perhaps one last question. The, the work you are doing at the moment, how is that fi financed? How do you get money for, for, for your work? <laughs> well, um, some of the work we are paid for, so women pay us to look after. So we look after 
all women, to be honest. And some women are quite wealthy. They will pay us to look after them antenatally or postnatally or both. We have to work with um, uh, 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 an organization, a private organization that's set up uh, to, it has professional indemnity insurance and it gives that to us to look after women for the, for the birth section or indeed the whole pathway. Because the UK um, is now required, as, as I guess every, every country in Europe, we are all required to have indemnity insurance, sufficient professional indemnity insurance for, for birth. And the, the actual birth bit is a bit that's extremely expensive. And we're required to have um, insurance to the level of millions, three million has been quoted, 10 million has been quoted. And that is quite difficult. You need to be a, a company, an organization in order to, to access that. So whilst we're working on our model, we have to um, use an organization, a company to, to, to deliver the birth aspect. We also get money from the other work that we do. So there's not a lot of income from the aquanator, but we get a lot of um, support from the, the, the people who host us. So it, there's not a lot of income at the moment, but I think our passion for the profession and our passion to improve the lives of women, whoever they are, keeps us going. Okay. Thank you very much for that answer. I think we are at the end of the session and our time. So uh, thank you, Elsie, very much for your contribution. Um, I put uh, some links uh, about midwifery in, in the UK and uh, some uh, 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 information about refugees in um, in the UK in the chat box, so perhaps that is helpful. So um, thanks everybody for joining this uh, this session. Um, and um, uh, the question is now: um, I think we have some feedback. Um, a link to a feedback uh, survey. Is it true? Yes, that's true. I'll post the link in the, in the chat box. It is there now. So I will turn off 